maximal lifespan for us as a species is 115 years. You know, it's a statistical analysis. We kind of agree. We can argue about the number. There is somebody who lived to be 122, but our capacity is for 115 years. And we die in the United States now on average age of 76. So there are things that we can do without being very dramatic. And we have to do them. <laughs> we should do them now. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. In today's episode, I sit down with Dr. Nir Barzilai, an endocrinologist and geroscientist, to further discuss the biology of aging and what we can do about it. Nir is considered a leader in the science of aging and longevity. He's published over 300 peer-reviewed papers and is the author of Age Later, a book that he published in 2020 for the general public to better understand aging. In this exchange, we focus on Nir's work with centenarians, people who live to 100, how longevity genes protect such people from disease, and the TAME trial, a study he's setting up to investigate whether metformin, a drug used to treat type 2 diabetes, can slow the development of age-related diseases and prevent premature death in adults without diabetes. Similar to last week's episode with Matt Cablin on aging, it does get a little technical at times, but I still think there's plenty of interesting and hopefully accessible takeaways. With that, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Nir Barzilai. You say aging is flexible. It has a biology. What does that mean? Does, does that mean that aging is not a given and that we can do certain things to slow our rate of aging down or even reverse aging? Yes, that, that's absolutely true. Look, um, this is our story. We have 100,000 years of human evolution. Uh, you know, we can argue how much. But until 150 years ago, so almost 100,000 years, life expectancy was between 20 and 30. And something happened quite rapidly in the last 150 years. You know, we kind of harnessed agriculture. We cleaned the water. We built sewers. We have immunization, you know. By the way, lots of prevention, right? Lots of prevention. And all of a sudden, we tripled our life expectancy. But that, that came in a price. And the price is, after the age of 60, you accumulate diseases that we never had during evolution, OK? There were no cancers, diabetes. People didn't die from that. Alzheimer's, you know, cardiovascular disease. Um, and so we are now stuck in this paradigm and what we've discovered is that this doesn't have to be that way because if you actually harness the biology of aging you can prevent all of those diseases and we proved it in many ways you know variety of animals you know human studies lots of things but yeah what you said is true aging death i think is will happen but Aging the way it is shouldn't shouldn't go on. We know what to do about it. Where did your personal interest in, in aging come from? Because as I know it, I believe you started out your career, you were a medic in the army. How did how did you go from, from doing that that work and then becoming interested in longevity and studying longevity genes? Well it it actually started much earlier when uh, my grandfather was 68 and by the way i'm i'm almost 68 and and he looked you know 30 years older than me now he was he was balding or or white with you know was heavy uh, was moving slowly but he told me about what he's done when he was young and i'm looking at him and i'm i'm saying i i don't get it because when you're a kid and you think you have imagination, one imagination most kids don't don't have is that they're going to look exactly like their grandparents. Mm. Okay, they don't, where, where did they come from, right? <laughs> and for me, it was always the major the the major problem. Even when I went to medical school and and I'm I'm an internist and I'm an endocrinologist, so 
yeah, uh, your glucose can be high. You can have blood pressure. You can have you you can have cholesterol. But if if you look at people in a hall in a movie theater, you don't know who has the diabetes or cholesterol or hypertension. But you know who's old and who's young. So that was for me the real interest in 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 the biology. The rest seems to be like little things. But what happens that you change so rapidly and you start getting sick and 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 you start accumulating disease and your quality of life is terrible what what's going on tell us about the the work that you've done looking at centenarians and and i guess why as a model how studying centenarians can help us better understand what influences health span yeah yeah great uh, so i'll i'll start with with the model and and really uh, when you take 100 years old, the first question that you're asking is, okay, so did they get sick when everybody got sick and they were just sick longer? Or did their lifespan and health span, did they go together? And, and it was the second thing, okay? The, this centenarian got sick 20 to 30 years after a after others at the same time are getting sick. Actually, the people who were born with them, their life expectancy was about 50. Okay, So they doubled the life expectancy of the people who were born with them. But if you compare it to people who are living at the same time, they're healthier 20, 30 years longer. Uh, not only that, okay, not only that, they have what we call a contraction of morbidity. It means they're sick very little time at the end of their lives. So they live healthy, 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 and they die. And the point here, okay, there are people who can achieve health span and longevity. What is their secret and how can we imitate it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard you speak about this and I think it's it's really interesting. So tell us. What are, what are centenarians, and, and for anyone who's hearing that for the first time, that's people that have lived to 100 or older, what, what are they doing that's, that's special in, in terms of their lifestyle, or are they, are they genetically protected? Did they win the genetic lottery? Yeah, so, yeah, there's nothing special about them. You know why? Because... Um, uh, Half of them are obese or overweight, so it's not that they're lean or or they don't eat. 60% of the men and 30% of the women are smoking, okay? So it's not that they do the right thing. Um, exercising, and I'm, I'm talking even about moderate exercise, like biking or housework, less than 50%. So there's nothing special about how they deal with the environment, okay? Which actually was kind of interesting to us because in spite of what they are doing, and, and of course, I'm not telling, you know, somebody already did it. He took my the paper that I wrote and said, well, the secret to longevity is to smoke, to eat, to, <laughs> you know. But no, for them, it didn't matter. For us, mm -hmm. it matters a lot. For them, it didn't matter because what they have is what we call longevity genes. They have uh, changes on their DNA that allows them to be resilient, to escape diseases, and to live much, much longer. Hmm. What is it, what, what could explain why someone wins the genetic lottery and has these longevity genes? Because if I think about this from an evolutionary point of view, and you're far better to answer this than I am, I'm just, just sort of going to tell you what's coming to the top of mind right now, but evolution really is caring about reproduction it's selecting, I guess, mostly for reproduction. Um, perhaps there's some other reasons as well. But is it that these genes, these longevity genes, are beneficial to reproduction and then they just also happen to improve lifespan? Exactly. And if you connect it to the story that I told you that 100,000 100, uh, years of evolution, life expect expectancy was 20, 30. But by the way, there were always some old people, but we weren't chosen. <laughs> to be old, right? We were chosen to try and survive 20 and 30 years and have kids, okay? Because that's how evolution works. So you're totally right. Uh, when you have our kids, if the parents die the, the next day because they're weak <laughs> or, 
or they live for 100 years because they have longevity genes is not evolution anymore, okay? The evolution really doesn't, doesn't do it. So it's a total coincidence, the fact that, uh, that, that when they age, they have something that protect them. It wasn't something that was chosen by evolution, but it's something that it exists now that we have those people living to be 100. And these these genes that they they have that are protecting them. What I what I heard earlier is that there's a for most of us mere mortals there's a mismatch between our genes and the environment we're in today and the behaviors that we subsequently adopt. But these people are protected against that environment because of certain genes. What are these genes doing in their body that sort of protects them from the environment? So I'll, I'll tell you a, a story that is an example. Okay. Um, so, um, one of the things we need to do in order to get to reproduction, we need strong growth, or in other words, growth hormones. By the way, there's one growth hormone, but there are many growth hormones, okay? So we need growth hormones. But when we age, we have to shift our energy from growth to actually protect us against the breakdown that starts happening with aging. It doesn't make any sense to put investment in growth when we have so many other troubles, right? It happens that 60% of our centenarians have some defect in the way those growth hormones work. So that's a very strong genetic, uh, genetic signature. Now, uh, it's interesting that in nature, it's very common, you know, the, the ponies live longer than the thoroughbreds and the little dogs live longer than the, the large dogs. And uh, when you do things, you manipulate in the lab with, le with, with growth hormone, if they have more, they die. If they have less, they survive. So it's all over nature and it's true for human centenarians as well. So to kind of connect this back to how this is helpful for the average person and, and thinking about how we uh, can possibly slow down or address aging. You're looking at these these genes that are protecting people, helping them live long lives, and also there's that contraction of morbidity, so they have increased health span. And then are we essentially looking at, okay, they have these genes that affect these pathways, so how can we you tap into various interventions that can perhaps affect biology in the same way, whether that's through a lifestyle diet or fasting, or is it through a drug or is it through gene therapy? Is that the kind of way we're thinking about all of this? Great question. So for, first of all, when you have genetic discovery, what you learn is the mechanism and you most, in most cases, you can develop drug against this mechanism, okay, against this gene. You don't have to do, in most cases, you don't need to have genetic uh, genetic treatment, okay? So this is one thing that should be clear to the listeners. The fact that we're looking for genes doesn't mean we have to give genes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's all about drug development. And so two examples, okay? Um, when we discover those genes in centenarians, we now, you know, usually we used to go from mice and try to develop drugs to affect human. And we failed 95% of the time. But now we're doing differently. We're finding the mechanism in humans and then we're developing drug and we see how it works in animals. So it happens that we didn't develop that, but a lot of pharmaceuticals developed an antibody. Okay, we know what's antibody now after COVID. An antibody against the receptor of one of the growth hormones. It's a growth hormone that's called IGF-1. And we administered it to older animals, to older mice. And they lived much healthier and much longer than the mice where we gave only placebo. So, oh. so yes, the, by the way, this IGF receptor antibody was developed to treat cancer beca because cancers also have growth and also have this mechanism of growth 
that pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical try to target, but they fail because cancers are much smarter than that. Mm -hmm. But for aging, it actually worked. Okay, so that's an example of treatment that potentially can affect humans. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's even something that exists now. There's a drug that's called metformin. And metformin is a drug that's given to diabetic patients, but it's actually what we call a gerotherapeutic. It actually delays aging significantly. It delays all the diseases of aging that, that we know of. And one of the things that metformin is doing is decreasing the level of this growth hormone. Right. So I gave you just two examples. There's genetic mm -hmm. defect and there, there are ways to deal with that and to imitate those centenarians. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a couple of questions, and I, I definitely want to carve out time to go through Metformin and, and, and Tame with you. Um, seems like there's a lot of interesting things happening there for people to, to be aware of. With regards to developing a drug, for example, you mentioned their IGF-1, but earlier you also mentioned that um, – sometimes a, a certain pathway may be beneficial earlier in life and then could be deleterious later in life. So how do we think about administration of a drug from the, I guess, the time of intervention? When are we intervening? Are we intervening early in life or are we intervening late in life once someone has already aged? Yeah. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. So, so this is, this is really a, a, a great answer and, and it's mainly to first of all, point out if we're going to talk about metformin or, or let me start with, you said it really good, things that are good for you uh, early can be against you when you're old. We're calling it antagonistic pleotrophy, okay? But it works the other way around. It's possible that things that are good when you're old are against you when you're young, like metformin, right? I don't want to give metformin to young people for, for a variety of reasons, but for example, because there it lowers growth hormone. Metformin also lowers testosterone in men. Metformin also prevents in young people uh, who are exercising the muscle to grow just as much as if they didn't take metformin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are trade-offs on the drugs that we want to give to aging. And it's very important to note that if you're not old, you, you shouldn't take the drug because I don't think this drug is going to work well for you unless you're diabetic or obese or PCSO, there are indications to give metformin in young, young people, but you have to have an indication like that. Certain, certainly bodybuilders, I would say, if you want to be, build your body, you, you, don't, you don't take metformin, you don't take uh, rapamycin, you don't, you don't take any, any of those drugs. So that, that's, that's a very uh, important point. But then you said something else. You said, could we start could we start at a younger age? And, and the answer here, if you, if you ask me to tell you what I think will happen in 50 years, I'll tell you what I think, is that people who are 20 years old will undergo a treatment every few months or a year where they're going to get a cocktail of drugs that will erase the aging out of their cells. And they'll repeat it. And they'll be Peter Pan. They'll they'll never grow old, okay. So so yes, uh, I I think there there can be intervention earlier on, but we now have to start uh, first of all stopping the aging process in the people who are aging, be and in parallel work on okay our kids our grandkids how do they how do we make them uh, not age. What would you say, Nir, I'm conscious that someone might be listening to this and might be thinking, this sounds like big pharma trying to get their hands on, a, on another aspect of health and, and getting young people taking drugs earlier, early in life. Um, and they might say, that's, that's not natural. Shouldn't we just focus on lifestyle and fixing the environment? So how would you, how would you kind of respond to that? Yeah, yeah, th those things are are more are not mutually uh, exclusive. So let me just give you examples. It's not only about aging; it's about people who survive cancer. Remember, for cancer, we give kids uh, and adults radiation, chemotherapy. We age them. Okay, so they age; they're getting older much more rapidly. Their kids 
that getting heart attack at the age 35, so they need help, okay? People who have HIV, and it's probably because of the, the available treatment, have diseases 10 years before their cohort. By the way, poor people, <laughs> just think of poor people, poor people at every city live 20, 30 years less than, than rich people, okay? Uh, or another example, if we want to go to Mars, um, then we'll never get there without stopping aging. We'll get cancer or heart disease on the way and we're not coming back, okay? So there's many reasons why we need to intervene with aging, okay? Uh, and to develop strong ways to, to intervene with aging. Now, you're absolutely right. There are four things that we can do with the environment and they are much more, and if you do them, you're much more likely to get over the age of 80 uh, and be healthy for much longer. And this is exercise, it's diet, it's sleep, and it's basically not being lonely or, you know, your social uh, interaction. Each one, I can talk about each one of them, but this is something that's available now, is practiced now, and we know that this is good at any age, any sex. You, uh, you, you, can, you can really, uh, by interacting with the environment, do really, really, really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's save a little bit of space for that at the end, uh, perhaps, perhaps after we've gone through TAME. Is, is, you mentioned they're 80 to 85 in good health. Is that is that the goal? If if we haven't been, uh, if we haven't received these longevity genes, we don't. We haven't won the genetic lottery. Can we get to to one hundred, or is that really out of reach? And for most people, it's it's a case of trying to optimize health span to get to eighty to eighty five in good health. You you know, I, I maximal lifespan for us as a species is 115 years, okay? You know, it's a statistical analysis. We kind of agree. We can argue about the number. There is somebody who lived to be 120, but our capacity is for 115 years. And we die in the United States now on average age of 76. So there are things that we can do without being very dramatic, okay? And we have to do them. <laughs> we should do them now. And it doesn't mean that we're not going to cross. I, I gave you this Peter Pan scenario. If you can erase aging every year, the, any slow aging like that, I don't know that 115 is something that we cannot uh, break through. And, and, I, and I, I'm not saying that there's no other way to break through this 115. So there is there's some uh, health span years that, that we can uh, get, and we can get them by the environment, we can uh, get there by drugs and by combination of drugs. Now, the pharmaceutical, I wish, I wish you were right. The pharmaceuticals, a lot of them are on the fence, okay? They're looking for, you are going to, we're going to talk about TAME, they're looking for study like TAME so that they know that the FDA looks at aging is something that, that uh, can be prevented or the disease of aging, I should say, that disease of aging can be prevented. And if the FDA looks favorably at that, then they're all going to jump in because it's, it's, it's uh, lucrative mm -hmm. <laughs> to have drugs that you take all your life, right? And prevent aging. Mm. How do we connect this to the hallmarks of aging? That was a concept that Matt Cablin introduced last week. You speak here of Peter Pan and kind of being able to intervene perhaps earlier in life to slow down or prevent the aging process. Is this where the hallmarks of aging come in in terms of understanding what's driving aging as a process itself and, and then thinking about interventions from there? Right. So um, how do you become a hallmark of aging? You have to show that it goes wrong when you age. And if you fix it in animals, they live healthier and longer, okay? This is the concept. But there is something very interesting about those hallmarks. You don't have to target all of them to get the effect. You can target one of them and affect the others. And, th and that's really beautiful because that's what biotechs are doing. They are 
choosing a hallmark, and they know that they can affect others, which means they can have several indication also to look at. You know, it gives them a lot of a lot of choice. Metformin, the drug that I mentioned before, actually targets all the hallmarks of aging. Now, really, is it possible that God created this? It, it, it's an extract of fresh lilac, so it's it's. But, but by the way, it's not considered nutraceutical. You have to get a prescription. But, you know, so what happens is if you take an old cell or an old organ or an old person and you make them young, you fix a lot of things. You fix a lot of hallmarks. Okay? So whatever metformin is doing, either primarily or secondary, it fixes aging. And we know it because it, it basically affects all the hallmarks of aging. Once, once we used to argue, metformin does that. No, metformin does that. Yeah, everybody is right. It's just that it fixes something and then everything else follows. In terms of a, an overall, I guess, medical approach, if we think about the, the entire sort of public health um, and medicine in general, do you think the field switching its focus to targeting aging as opposed to sort of siloing off things and targeting cardiovascular disease and targeting cancers separately and sort of more going upstream to these hallmarks of aging, which is kind of how I understand it at least, do you think that will give us greater results in terms of changes in health span and lifespan? The answer is that there, there's no other practical way to do it uh, unless TAME is done. Because if you're a biotech, okay, and there's no uh, there's no indication to treat aging, you're trying to find a disease for which you'll develop this drug. And once this drug is, is there, let's say like metformin is for diabetes, okay? So maybe you develop a diabetes drug and then you test it for several diseases and you build the case that it actually targets aging. But from a biotech perspective, you know, your investors want you to get to an indication as soon as possible. And, and, and some of those indications are possible. Also, remember that the, the drugs can target a disease, can target the disease too. In other words, the drugs, we, we see aging as preventable, okay? So that diseases are preventable. But even when you get the disease, aging doesn't stop. Aging will get you the next disease. So you can intervene also in old people. And some of the drugs we have are drugs that you give to old people and maybe they're better in old people than young people. I don't know if uh, you heard about senolytics or senescent cells, the zombie cells. Those zombie cells are accumulating and they're accumulating more when you're old and they cause a lot of local damage and promote cancer and other things. If you can kill those, and, and at least in mice it works, and there's some evidence in humans, but not, not compelling yet, but if that works, then you extend the health span of an old person and you don't have to and, and maybe it's like like metformin maybe it's not good when you're young i've seen some people suggest that if we focus on cardiovascular disease and cancer sort of as we have been and even if we were able to eradicate those diseases leading causes of death that it wouldn't make a huge difference to lifespan that people would probably just die of something else is that something that you've thought about? Uh, absolutely. That that's our major that's our, our major point here. That if you target the biology of aging, which is the risk factor for each one of those diseases, then you don't prevent one disease; you prevent all the diseases. And th that's what we're trying to show to the FDA that seemingly unrelated disease or related only by age uh, can be prevented. In fact, for us in a trial, the diseases that you get are we're agnostic to them. We we don't really care which disease you're going to get. 
because you're going to get one point for every one of those diseases. If your mother was diabetic and you're obese, you'll get diabetes first and you'll get something else later. But for us, it doesn't matter. We are going to look at what happens to elderly uh, if we treat their aging part in a, in a controlled way and show that the whole cluster of diseases is moved. So we are talking about the prevention of a cluster of diseases because as you said, if we'll treat just cardiovascular disease, then you'll get Alzheimer's. Was that a good exchange? So TAME trial. Let's let's take a, a step back if, if someone's hearing about that for the very first time. Tell tell me about your journey, I guess, with setting up TAME trial and why the decision, I guess, to to use metformin as the intervention of choice. So um, metformin is a drug that was used in the 1920s to 50s uh, to prevent the flu, malaria, to treat arthritis. And then it was noticed that it also lowers glucose in diabetic people. It's very serendipitous that in 1987, I was a fellow at Yale University and my project was to, uh, uh, to find out the mechanism of action of metformin on diabetes, okay? Although I was interested in aging then, I didn't really know that metformin is a gerotherapeutics. I'm saying this word gerotherapeutics, you know, to treat geriatrics. Um, I didn't know that it's gerotherapeutics, but what happens with the years, with numerous studies, some are clinical studies, so they are controlled, some are association study, and, and huge amount of literature, it became apparent that Metformin prevents diabetes. Metformin prevents cardiovascular disease. Metformin prevents cognitive decline in people with mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer. Uh, metfor people, people who are metformin have 30% less cancer and all causes of cancer, not just one cancer. And people with metformin have half of the mortality if they're diabetic compared to other diabetics, but even compared to non-diabetics. Also, although people on metformin are more obese, they're diabetic, they're more sick, they die less than people who are not diabetic at all. So actually there's all the evidence, there's all the preliminary data to show that what we're trying to do was, was done, but it was done in a disease context. We came to the FDA and we said, hey, we, there, there's a drug that is very safe, has been used by billion, you know, billion years of use and uh, has been around, is safe, is cheap. And we want to do a study where we're going to show in the same people that we're preventing not one or two, but th th three diseases and mortality. And and we believe that by doing that, then all of a sudden we get an indication that is like prevention of aging. The the study that I think one of the studies that you were you were alluding to, I think it was Bannister, the, that paper back in 2014 that showed the the uh, folks with type two diabetes that were taking metformin lived longer than the those in the general population who were didn't have diabetes and were not taking metformin. I saw a, a, a paper, I think maybe it was a year ago, I'm sure you've seen it out of Denmark, that seemed to find the opposite. Did you see that? Well, not not the opposite, but, um, you, you know, the, the, the Bannister paper was in the UK and had $180,000 uh, 180, people out of pharmacies. That were treated by the same doctors. the 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 paper from Denmark was from uh, their health records, and what they showed that uh, people who are on metformin and normal people do not have different mortality. Okay, so the part of people without diabetes have less mortality wasn't shown in Denmark, um, but they didn't show. <laughs> that people on metformin actually live longer than, than people with diabetes, okay? With people with diabetes, they're not treated with 
sure. with metformin. Okay, so so that that was that was a a, a major problem, and it, it's possible. Look, I I think most likely the people in the UK are more obese generally. And the people in Denmark are more lean, except the diabetic ones. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think obesity is something that accelerates aging. So th this wasn't reported, you know, wh wh what are those people? How much do they weigh? And, and, and because if they were lean and the diabetic were obese, then I think that would uh, that would explain some of this study. Gotcha. But but really, I I don't think it really uh, matters. In one population, it works. In another population, it doesn't work. But in any case, everybody's showing that people on metformin are doing as good or better than people without diabetes. Okay. So yeah. I I I think. I think it doesn't matter. What matters to me is not the mortality. But by the way, there are other studies in diabetic patients, clinical studies that showed that mortality was decreased by 40% by metformin. Okay, it's not, it's not the only, the, those two are not the only studies. Those are more of the epidemiological studies. Are those studies near comparing people with diabetes taking metformin to people with diabetes not taking metformin or are they comparing it to general public without diabetes to to general uh, people without diabetes okay okay so right so is is metformin they, they try to answer is in den in denmark does metformin increase people with diabetes on metformin do they live longer than people without diabetes and in Denmark, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. But we know that people with diabetes live less <laughs> mm -hmm. than people right. without diabetes. Okay, they didn't have that data there. Right. Yeah. So I, I I take your point that it might depend on the longevity benefit of metformin could depend on the health of the general population that you're comparing against. So that could explain the difference between the UK study and the Denmark study. Um, I, I think I don't have evidence, right? right. So I'm not, uh, and they didn't provide the evidence also with, with the other study, but uh, but that, that would be my guess. But I, I think it's not, you know, it's not a major, major problem. We do, we want to give metformin to people without diabetes anyhow, okay? and to show that they are going to live longer and healthier. Quick one. If you'd like some inspiration to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level, be sure to check out my digital plant-based ferments guide. Inside are some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labne and homemade kombucha. Learn more at theproof.com forward slash ferments. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. So I want to come back to the trial and get into the specifics and, and what it looks like. But there was there's one other study near that I had shared with me and I wanted to get your thoughts on it. It was from the Diabetes Prevention Program. I think it was a very old randomized controlled trial, maybe when I say very old, late 90s or so. And I believe that was people without diabetes that were high risk of diabetes, given metformin or placebo. And then they followed them for a couple of decades later. And they seemed to not find... I guess, a longevity benefit to metformin. So I wondered if, if you'd looked at that. Of course, we, we are, I, I, I'm at, uh, we're a DPP center, so I, I know everything about it. Okay, so you have to, ex to understand one thing. The same study, right? The same study have showed that people without diabetes that get metformin, okay, they, they, it prevents diabetes by 30%. Okay, that was the study. Uh, the effect was so... Uh, strong that they actually finished the study after four years because they they didn't want people not to be able to take metformin so the study a, a, a ended in the late 90s i think or or early 2000 i don't remember but it's yeah because they are 20 years later and they are not in a study anymore okay they're just followed what right. happened to them is some of those who were not on metformin are now on metformin. Some of those who were on metformin are not on metformin, and many are in other drugs. So uh, I, I think it's ridiculous to even, I, I don't understand why this study is even done, 
because it's not a study anymore. Now it's a free observation for people who totally change their way. So it's not that you're following people who still take metformin versus those who are not. It's not. It's a total crossover. So I, I don't know how, and, and I, I know people who are interested in metformin picked up on that, but for me, they are control studies, including the DPP when it was a control study that showed the effect on diabetes, on cardiovascular. So you take them 20 years later and they're, and, 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 and you think that the fact that they were on metformin four years before is going to change something now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So come back to the trial. 3,000 plus people, I believe, there's 14 odd locations planned. I think you're, you're planning to conduct this over six years. W walk us through all of this. What, what is TAME? As, as I believe now, you haven't started, you're still funding the study, but perhaps you can give us an update on where it's at and then what this trial sort of looks like and what you're hoping to answer. So, um, so the idea is to take 3,000 people between the ages 65 and 79, but that they're already starting to age. You know, we don't want to take the centenarians, right? People who start to age, they walk slowly, they have some diseases and give them metformin. Half of them are getting metformin and half, half of them are getting placebo. And our major aim, you know, our, um, our what's called the primary outcomes are the cluster of cardiovascular disease, cancer, cognitive decline, and mortality. We want to show that we take this cluster and we prevent it with metformin. It's planned for six years because we need the money for six years instead in case it doesn't happen after four years. There, there's lots of issues that we're watching here because we're not supposed to be significantly affecting any one disease. So let's say, let's say that three years in the study, the FDA comes and say, you have to stop the study because you prevented cardiovascular disease significantly. So we cannot show the rest of the aging. It would be devastating for us. So we want to have enough people so that every one of those disease will contribute. But what we significant is the cluster the overall health, the mortality, this is what we're tackling. Mm -hmm. Is this the first trial, Nia, that is is sort of set up to targeting aging? Absolutely. And we, we thought about, we had a big committee, wonderful people, a, a wonderful statistician that came up with this study. By the way, this planning of this study, getting the approval of the FDA was... You know, it took two years, okay? We published the papers, everybody can look at it. it it's a very sound, uh, it's a very sound plan and everybody who reviewed it thought that it's a great plan, okay? We don't have any problem with it. The problems were with, with funding. And the first problem was the NIH. Now, the NIH is stands for the National Institutes of Health. If you think of it, we don't have National Institute of Health. We have National Institutes of Diseases. We have the National Cancer Institute and the National Heart and Lung uh, Diseases and Kidney and, you know, um, and they're in silos. And we are at the National Institute of Aging. That's the only institute that is actually dealing with health. <laughs> okay. But when a study, like a big study like that is reviewed, who are the experts? Those who understand cardiovascular disease, cancer, okay, all those things. And they, because we're in silos, they don't know about aging. They read this grant and they write without a shame in the summary statement. Those guys think that aging can be targeted and one drug can do it. They're out of their minds, okay? Um, so we have a, a, a problem that that always happen with science when something good new is coming and it doesn't matter what's the evidence people who didn't hear about it don't accept it as a truth okay so it, it was devastating so we went to the organization that does aging research all 
throughout its career, and that's the American Federation for Aging Research. And the American Federation for Aging Research is, is the, the body that's going to be responsible for TANG. And so, okay, but we needed funding from a, another source. And this is a longer a, a story, but things have happened and things have fallen through and then COVID happened. And when COVID happened, initially I thought that's great because we didn't want to be in, you know, to do the study in the middle of COVID, it would, it would have stopped the study anyhow. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have third of the money that we think will help us get the rest and we're antsy and frustrated and we want to really start it fast but uh, it, it was just amazing that you have all the data you have tons of data you have people who wrote the papers about it you have a proof of concept it, it already has been done as I told you and still, it's so hard to build a, a, a coalition to, to do this study. And, and I have to tell you another thing. We cannot start a study. We cannot recruit somebody for a four or six year study. And after you say, you know, I'm sorry, we don't have money. We, we, the IRB will not let us do it. So we have to secure the money uh, before we go. And we need uh, about five, six million dollars more a year for four years, five years, maybe six years in order to do the study. And uh, and uh, we have people coming and going, but we haven't nailed it yet. Mm -hmm. Are you still confident that it will go ahead? Look, the need, the need to tame, the need for tame, there are so many people who need tame. Uh, first of all, some some of the people who are not in aging and they don't see the promise and they don't read what we know and they don't get into that, they want a proof of concept. That's a catch-21. You know, what, what you're going to do it? Show me that it can be done. Well, yeah, we want to show you that it can be done. And we took this drug. By the way, you said why metformin. Uh, you heard about rapamycin, right, from Matt. Rap, there's no preliminary data on rapamycin on any of that. There were no clinical trials on, on rapamycin that have showed the depth of what metformin is doing and the safety, okay? Uh, so th there, there's no comparison. It had to be metformin, but metformin was a great drug to start with. And, 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 and still, the proof of concept is, is necessary. Second is the FDA. Third is a template for the pharmaceutical because... You know, three, uh, pharmaceuticals that want to show effect on cardiovascular disease, they need 12,000 people. Their, their studies are five times more expensive than if you do an aging uh, a trial. And there, there's lots of other, you know, Longevity Biotech Association uh, needs the proof of concept. Everybody needs TAME to happen. And because of that, I'm sure the TAME will happen. And I'm sure that our bad luck and bad years will, will close soon because everybody in the field agrees that it has to happen. Okay, I want to learn a little bit more about the trial from you. So you have 3,000 plus people. That's what you're hoping for. These are healthy individuals or individuals aged 65 to 79 without a chronic disease, I think if I, if I heard correctly. And then they're being randomized to either metformin or to placebo and then you track them over this sort of four or six year period, you're looking at this composite outcome, which is um, a, a, a sort of cluster of these different age-related diseases that you've put together. What What's the dose of metformin that subjects are taking? How was that decided? Um, so some of us said, you know, it's elderly, we should give them less. And some of them, are you kidding? We're targeting aging, we should give them more. So we decided to go by where the data was. And all those studies that showed, you know, a 30% effect on variety of things were aiming at around 1,500 milligrams. And that's what we're going to do. It is possible that there's a dose response, but it's more likely that there's an individual change. And we'll, we'll figure out what's the individual change. I think 
1500 will will get the the job because he did it for all the other studies and regarding the outcomes something that that Matt and I spoke about last week which is a, was a separate sort of uh, conversation around epigenetic clocks and I'm sure you've seen these are getting a lot of attention and there's various commercial companies sort of selling these to measure your biological age and when i was reading about tame i saw that you had this sort of side project set up as tame bio and i wanted to i guess uh hear from you on whether you you're 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 looking at these age-related disease outcomes but had you ever thought about trying to um look at how metformin is affecting the hallmarks of aging and, and and sort of whether it was using an epigenetic clock or some other um type of tool to to measure aging at a cellular level yes yeah, so look it's a major challenge uh, the biomarkers and, and i actually have a project that can jump start it even before tame but tame is the study that's going to resolve the biomarkers because what we're doing is what we call omics we're going to take every measure that is available that we know changes with aging the proteins that are changing the epigenetic that is changing the metabolites that are are changing the glycan every one every part of the biology and we're measuring everything we can measure about it you know we'll measure 10,000 proteins and 100,000 metabolites and 200 uh, you know epigenetic methylation sites on the genome and our goal is to take all this data and to say you know what what are the 10 top or the 50 top or the 100 top biomarkers that are going to change with therapy okay there are two different things we can tell you now what's your biological age compared to your chronological age with epigenetic data and we can do it you know, pretty well. But this is not it. We want to show which biomarkers change with treatment. They're not all going to change to in treatment or they might change in the wrong direction. Okay. So this is only in clinical study will be able to get those biomarkers and the NIH is going to pay this part for TAME. Mm. Is there any front runners there? Any predictions that you have about blood biomarkers that you think will give the best insight into biological age and I guess the effectiveness of an in intervention? Yes, I, I can tell you my bias, which makes it only 50% chances of being right. Okay. But so first of all, you know, methylation clocks are not changing so fast. Okay. We want to develop biomarkers that will change in three or six months. We want biotechs to do a study and show that their biomarkers are changing so they can go to phase three trial and not spend billion of dollars when it wasn't going to change, right? Methylations are not really the best way to do that. Or maybe there are some methylation sites that will do it, but we don't know it yet. I'm quoting the methylation experts. It's not changing nine months, a year. It doesn't change re really fast. So I'm not giving great hope to the methylation, at least for the, the short, short studies or what happens in TAME within half a year or a year. The, for me, the promising one, and I've been spending lots of time, is proteomics. Uh, the, we, we have uh, identified proteins that are changing uh, between age 65 and 95. There are lots of proteins that are changing between this age. Some of them can be protective, right? If, if you have infection, you'll have inflammation response, okay? So when you have breakdown of aging, you can have other things, uh, other responses. But what was interesting to me, and there are lots of biomarkers that are changing. By the way, the growth hormones are changing. But uh, for me, the most interesting thing that took me a while because it was annoying at first, there was lots of breakdown. Breakdown of collagen and of cells and of platelets and of matrix. And I said, okay, okay, you know. And then, and then I thought, okay, but just a minute. What, however we treat aging, we have to, stay, to stop this breakdown. And maybe this breakdown of proteins will be the most sensitive uh, way to 
show that we actually do something to stop aging. As I understand it, what you're saying is those biomarkers from TAME could be very useful for the entire field of science looking at geroprotective compounds. Correct. In the absence of these biomarkers now, what are what are the best sort of blood biomarkers that that give us an idea of someone's biological age or risk of disease today? Things that maybe you keep an eye on. So, so I do think that there are several of those epigenetic clocks that have really did a pretty good distinction between biological and chronological age. They have a predictive value. Some of them have have looked at the prediction of mortality. Some of them prediction of, of diseases. Not all of them are predicting disease. But but I think they're they are pretty good and they're in in advanced stage of development. They're developing all the time. So I would watch them. Okay. For tame, you know, when, when we ask for biomarkers, we suggested several biomarkers that we already uh, know, and, and we did a, a huge literature uh, search for, we're, we're looking at biomarkers that were used for interventions, ver- vers- whether it was lifestyle intervention or people that were on metformin or other things and improved some function. And we got to seven biomarkers that we're going to measure no matter what. Um, one is this IGF-1, this growth hormone, insulin, hemoglobin A1C, which is really the average of your glucose level, mm-hmm. uh, cysteine C, which is um, a kidney marker, um, TNF alpha receptor 1 and 2, that is kind of an inflammatory market, marker, IL-6, and I might have forgotten something, but uh, basically those will be the biomarkers that have shown to change with treatment. And those you can, those, they, they have an advantage because I kind of skipped it. When you summarize and said those biomarkers will be used, we want biomarkers that the FDA will acknowledge that they're good biomarkers. And it's a problem because those biomarkers have to be measured the same way everywhere. Hemoglobin A1C, which is the diabetic marker, it doesn't matter which lab you're going to put it to do it, you're going to get the same number, okay? The biomarkers that we're going to find first are going to be in different companies. And if somebody else is going to do that, I don't know what levels they're going to get. So there's a lot... A, a lot really to do with biomarkers. But but if you're going to a doctor and you said, you know, I want to have my biological age and I want to maximize my health now, okay? I want you to tell me how to exercise, how to sleep, what to eat. And I want to see what happens after that. Those biomarkers will be good. Okay, so it sounds like some standardization might be needed with regards to those tests. Um, You mentioned earlier, Nir, I want to come back to something. You mentioned the studies that have looked at the association between metformin and I think dementia or neurodegenerative diseases. Um, Firstly, I guess, does metformin, do we know, does it cross the blood-brain barrier? It does. Okay. And Based on, I guess, your understanding of of metformin and its sort of mechanism of action, do we do we understand or appreciate how it could be affecting the brain? Every organ, okay. When, when we're talking about the hallmarks of aging, we are uh, talking about cellular hallmarks, okay. It's things that are happening in the cells, and no matter what cells we have in, on our body, um, those hallmarks are going to change with aging. They're not going to change similarly, okay? For example, the neurons seems to be more uh, related to the hallmarks of uh, proteostasis and mitochondria, okay? And maybe inflammation. They they have relatively different um, uh, importance. 
what what we've been doing with the proteomic, and this is a study that's led by Tony Weiss Corre in collaboration with us, is he figured out which proteins are secreted from different tissues. In other words, the proteomic is the plasma, okay? We measure it in the plasma, but those proteins are coming from somewhere, okay? So where are they coming from? And once we know where, where they are coming from, there'll be biomarkers that will reflect the aging of the brain and some that reflect the aging of the liver, and there'll be some overlap, but we could start focusing best, even with biomarkers, of which, which tissue is going to give up first, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Which disease we're going to get first. Are you, are you looking within that composite sort of outcome, the cluster of diseases, are neurodegenerative diseases in that? Yeah, so we are going to look at cognitive decline and Alzheimer's mm -hmm. as, as, as one of the, the endpoints. There's data on people who were treated, non-diabetic, who were treated with metformin in mild cognitive impairment. There are two studies that showed improvement, or I guess it's not improvement, they didn't deteriorate uh, as much in, in this period of time. In Alzheimer's, there, the studies that were done in the West have shown that metformin protects from Alzheimer's, but the ones that were done in China and in the East have not. Um, and the question is, does metformin not work well in uh, Chinese? But, but I think it's, um, I, I think it's um, the way they analyze the data. And let, let me tell you something that um, maybe, maybe you'll understand why it's complex. If metformin makes you live longer, then you might eventually get Alzheimer. If you don't correct for the time you're on metformin, you might actually have association of metformin and Alzheimer's, okay? It's, it's a little bit complicated when you get a drug that on one hand increases lifespan and, 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 and prevents disease, but how long does it prevent disease? So you, you might get those artifacts, but, uh, but this is what's available um, to us in cognitive decline. There are other studies that were done there's numerous studies that were done, big studies that showed that people on metformin are, are protected from cognitive decline. That bit about the US studies versus the Chinese is, is interesting. Do you think in any way someone's genes could modulate whether metformin is having a sort of beneficial, neutral or harmful effect on a certain tissue like the brain? Uh, absolutely. So, so uh, oh, okay, but this is why we need a clinical study. We're assuming that if there's enough genes in the population that does something to metformin, they'll equally be distributed between control and, and metformin, right? That's why we need clinical, clinical studies. But, but I'll tell you an anecdote. In our centenarians, we have six centenarians that have a protein that is uh, very in proximity to where metformin acts, okay? In other words, could be a protein that activates whatever metformin is doing in the complex of the mitochondria. So, uh, so maybe actually they have those longevity genes. We, we haven't been able to prove it all the way, so I'm, t I'm saying it's anecdote, but, it, but, but I'm just giving you an example of, of what happens. Now, if we take those centenarians and give them metformin, can we harm them, you know? Because actually metformin, <laughs> I, I don't want to regret the way I say it, so take it with a grain of salt. Metformin is a weak cyanide, okay? It, 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 it is toxic to the complex of the mitochondria. It's not toxic, but it inhibits the complex of mitochondria. So you can assume that if we give too much of it, you know, we can kill, <laughs> right? Which, which hasn't been, the major side effect of metformin, as far as I know, is longevity. Okay, it hasn't been killing people, but, 
but uh, it just shows you that w- at the end we're talking about personalized medicine and metformin effect is 30 percent but we can identify maybe people who are metformin is going to be 100 percent effective okay yeah i had read something and i'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it that perhaps metformin could increase the risk of dementia in apoe4 carriers is that something that you've you've come across i i know i read this uh, paper i found others and i i couldn't see that but we have in centenarians some um some genes that are actually interacting with apoe4 we have also mitochondrial derived peptide that are interacting and preventing the action of apoe4 so it's a good question but i don't i don't really have a, a proof in vitro proof that uh, with apoe4 metformin is not working and i'll tell you why because when you put metformin with neural cells or when you look at autophagy where you see how the garbage disposal happens in those cells it's dramatically increased by metformin. So I think metformin has overall good effects on whatever accumulates with, with Alzheimer. Now, if up for E4 inter, interferes that, maybe they're not effective with ApoE4, but I don't think that they're causing Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's just circle that back. That was a very scientific yeah. uh, uh, answer. Um, and and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but you know i don't know look every drug has trade-offs okay it's going to be like that that's why it has to be eventually personalized but we're looking for drugs that on a population have a large effect okay statins okay prevent heart disease 20 30 percent of those who takes it statins have other problems okay And, and and they actually prevent only one out of 10 heart attacks okay so Last sort of potential, I guess, side effect that I want to circle back to. You mentioned earlier the effect that that metformin could have on cardiorespiratory fitness and muscle mass. And we know that cardiorespiratory fitness and muscle mass both seem to correlate pretty strongly with longevity. So is your view that the the way that metformin impacts the hallmarks of aging um, is is powerful to the extent that it basically offsets any of those side effects and you still get a net benefit? So, uh, one, one paper uh, was a really good study where the investigator took elderly and exercised them. Half of them were on metformin, okay? Half of them were not. And to the surprise of the investigator, because they, they got grant that where they claimed that metformin and exercise will be better, okay? But in fact, exercise and metformin didn't allow, when you exercise your muscle grow, when, when, you know, gets bigger when you're elderly, when you're young and elderly. But those with metformin had significantly less growth of muscle, okay? It's interesting that you know, we write papers and we have the major figures, but then we have supplements. So in supplement four, they also show that when they measured the force of those people, you know, the force of the muscle, uh, hand grip, uh, you know, the way, the way they walked, w- whatever, four, four different things, it wasn't different between the groups. Okay. Interesting. It wasn't different. For you. So, so you have to understand if that wasn't different, then every gram of muscle with metformin did better, right? Because you had less muscle yeah. and still you had the same force. So we took the biopsies that were done in this study and we looked at the transcript of, of those muscles. And what we discovered is that the transcript that are mTOR dependent, okay, mTOR is this thing that we want to inhibit for aging. But if you want your muscle to grow, that's how it grows. It grows by mTOR, okay? So metformin, because it's an anti-aging, it decreased mTOR, and therefore the muscle didn't grow much. On the other hand, 
There were other transcripts, like for autophagy, inflammation, sen senescence, that were in the muscle that was treated with metformin. So there was a trade-off. Okay, there was a trade-off. The muscle was better, <laughs> but it wasn't as big. So the moral of the story, if you want your muscle to show up, don't take metformin. <laughs> if you want your muscle to be okay and you don't care if if it looks big, then you can take metformin and exercise. So what do you how do you feel, I guess, about people taking metformin now in the absence of clinical trial data from TAME? Um, or rigorous, I guess, clinical trial data in that sort of context of, of seeing how it affects aging. How do you feel about someone, let's say they're age 50 or 55, taking metformin as a sort of geroprotective compound? When, when we started with this team and when I was younger, I said, no, you don't, you don't take metformin until we do the study, okay? I'm actually thinking differently now because we're really not moving. We're not impacting. Our research has not been impacting. Uh, by the way, there, there are tens of millions of people who are taking metformin for aging, but it hasn't impacted the society, right? We don't see life <laughs> lifespan increasing because of metformin. And, and at this point, I'm really struggling, okay? I'm really struggling because... When I used to say it hasn't been shown to do this, to change this cluster, it's true. But it's still true that metformin has shown independently to do this and that and that and the other. <laughs> okay? So I've been packaging it in a way so that we'll get the FDA, but I'm worried that there are people who sh could benefit from metformin and maybe they should, and it's an ethical dilemma for me. And you think those are people that are aged between 65 and 79, or do you think that there would be benefit can, starting earlier than that? Uh, the, the, the issue here is that we do have biological age and chronological age, and there are people who are 50 years old, but they're 40 really, right? So 50 is a good age because mo all Almost all the studies of metformin, well, not all, most of the studies of metformin, the big studies of metformin recruited patients over the age of 50, okay? So this is where our data is, okay? Uh, so I, I would say over the age of 50 is yes. I, I, I want to say something else that is really related to that and why, why I'm thinking like that. Our medicine is very conservative, okay? The, 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 the first day we go to medical school, we learn do no harm, okay? Do no harm means I don't want to do anything, basically, you know? I don't want to do anything. The, by the way, the second day is there's not always and there's no never in medicine. So you, you always, you can make decision and always get screwed up or screw the patient, okay? So, so we're, we're conservative. And, and what's a little annoying to me with the conservatism is the fact that, you know, if your blood pressure is 120 or 120 over 80, okay, it's normal. But you know what? 110 over 70 is actually better. Okay, so why, why don't we get it there? LDL below 100? Yeah, LDL cholesterol, yeah? Below 100? Yeah, that'll be good. But, you know, we know that 70 is better. 10,000 steps a day is okay, but you know, if you do 10,000, why don't you do 13,000, okay? So I think if we want to start maximizing the health of, of people at age 50, we have to, to be more, more aggressive with more uh, tools that we have. And I think we have to start thinking like that because it certainly will, will benefit more than what we're doing now, checking out some normal. Normal is not maximizing. You mentioned that tens of millions of people would be taking metformin for for aging. And you said we're not seeing a huge effect on, on health span. But if you were to make a prediction, if everyone was doing this across the entire population, based on the entire body of research looking at metformin, what's the, the magnitude of effect that you think a compound like metformin could have on human health span or lifespan? So uh, two answers. So, so first of all, the, the, the simple answer is 
the the average will be two and th- two to three years of extension of health span. Okay, that that would be the average. Um, but it was calculated in a, a paper by um, Andrew Scott from London School of Economy. Uh, Andrew Scott says, remember how I told you there's a contraction of morbidity in centenarian. Uh, also, the CDC showed that the medical expense in the last two years of centenarian is third of those that are age 70. So we started talking about longevity dividend, the fact that people have less medical costs in, in the last days of life, in the last years of life. And Andrew Scott said, you're out of your mind because it's not, it's not that the patient is not in the hospital. What is he doing? He's traveling, he's shopping, he's buying things for his grandkids. The economy value that you have of having those people, resilient people, strong people going out, the, the economy value is immense. He actually calculated at $360 trillion in, in the next couple of years, which is an, an astro- astronomical value. But then he does something cute. He goes, he takes my data. I worked with him, takes my data on tape. And he takes the preliminary data and he says, okay, what is the economical value of the TAME trial? Now, remember the TAME trial have 1,500 people who are in placebo, only 1,500 are in metformin. And still, the economical value of TAME is $150 million mm-hmm. just because of those 1,500 people who are going to live healthier and longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, TAME costs, you know, $50, $70 million. Like, like the TAME study will make economical value of additional $100 million, right? But, but that, that is the answer. The, the, the healthcare, the health spend, the health span economy is absolutely huge, okay? It's huge. And we're trying now to lobby and to, to, to talk with governments and, and show them the data and say, this is, this is an economical value. And then people from the Far East are coming and saying, you know, in China, you have, for years, you had two parents with one kid, okay? And now the Chinese are saying, we, you know, we, can, we cannot have more elderly. Well, nobody's going to take care of those elderly. So what you have to do is actually improve their health span. Okay? That's what we have to do. There's no other solution. Okay? They're, they are, otherwise, they're going to die with great expense and nobody to take care of them. So just make them healthier. So oh, oh, ev- everything is lining up that there's no way for us to go the way we are. We have to target aging. We have to make it soon. We have to make it profound and last. Quick one. A lot of people ask me for tips on buying supplements and getting blood tests. I've created zero cost guides for both of these, which you can download from my website, theproof.com. I've heard you say before that you think there will be better geroprotective compounds than metformin. And you've kind of alluded to the fact of why you've used metformin currently it's it's already indicated lots of people are taking it the safety's there um there's evidence that it affects the hallmarks of aging etc etc um and i really admire i must say i admire your your passion and effort to push this field forward um you've mentioned many hurdles so i'm sure this has not been easy for you but given given the idea that there could be better geroprotective compounds out there how important is it that tame there's a positive result from tame what would it mean i guess for the field like and i'm sure you've thought about this if it turns out there's no association between the placebo and the metformin do you think this will kind of taint the field in any way or affect future funding for for other geroprotective compounds we, we will learn a lot from tame so l- let me give you just an example uh, metformin a New England Journal of Medicine uh, had a paper about people who are getting a, a, people with COVID, day three in COVID, they tried three different drugs that had reputation of targeting COVID, one of them at forming. 
Metformin around the world prevent hospitalization and death. Okay? So the study was designed this way. It was designed, to, the hypothesis was, well, you give those drugs, and the primary outcome, they prevent hypoxia. And the secondary outcome, they prevent hospitalization and death. And the study is reported negative. Although metformin decreases hospitalization and death by 50%. Why was it present pos positive? Because we're stupid, okay? We have an hypothesis. We decide what's our, our, uh, our uh, primary endpoint. And if the primary endpoint doesn't work, the rule is you cannot look at the secondary outcomes. Okay? But what if our hypothesis is wrong? They didn't have a hypoxia, A, because they didn't measure hypoxia well. That's what expert says. But B, metformin is not about preventing hypoxia. It's about making the body much stronger when you have a severe disease. Okay? I don't care if you had hypoxia or not. You're not going to die and you're not going to the hospital. So I'm giving that as an example. Uh, TAME was designed the way it did because it worked <laughs> already. Okay? So if anything, for me, is it going to end in four years or in six years? That, that's really why we need the money just to make sure that it works. But also TAME is looking not only at those primary outcomes, but a lot of secondary outcomes, which are related to infections and daily living and lots of other things. So, uh, so tame, TAME is going to, you know, it's most probably going to work because, <laughs> because we don't have this uh, hypothesis. We have already the, the proof <laughs> that, you know, we, we took studies that were done and we said, okay, we're going to do it again. So uh, with, with, with more evidence to that. So I'm, I'm actually not so worried uh, about it. But you're asking, I, I don't care if you're worried, what happened if TAME doesn't work? And I'm saying, I think part of TAMES will work. And, and if not, um, I'm just hoping that other drugs will come. Look, uh, rapamycin has failed in clinical trial. Again, it was a stupidity. It wasn't. It was an FDA stupidity, mainly in my mind. It wasn't. It wasn't that it wasn't working. It was working on the biology. It's just they ask people how they feel. If you are, if you ask eighty year old how the, how you feel, you'll get the, they'll all feel the same lousy. <laughs> That's what they'll tell you. We the geriatrician, you know, the geriatrician tell their patient if you if you wake up in the morning and you don't have pain. You're dead. <laughs> so, so that, so, so uh, you know, we, we're making uh, we're making lots of mistakes. There'll be other drugs, but I, I, I don't, I don't really. That's not what I fear about about uh, Tame. I think Tame is designed to work again. <laughs> mm -hmm. When, if everything goes to plan in terms of funding from here and rolling out the study when do you think we'll have results it sounds like it's going to be sort of 2030 or later oh god no well no i i think i think it will be much sooner um i i i think it'll be much sooner uh, but you know i've said it before i'm very first i mean tame should have been ended already okay <laughs> and, and, and as i told you initially with with covid i thought Oh, God bless for not doing tame, but but then tame has protected people. <laughs> they died less, so it would have been even better to have to have uh, COVID. But that's life in right, retrospect. And what other geroprotective compounds? So you mentioned metformin and rapamycin. Are there any others that your or or the field is sort of currently keeping an eye on that maybe have some potential? Yes, I'm, I'm a, a, an executive in the Longevity Biotech Association and uh, companies are doing very creative development of drugs and also targeting them to specific treatment. So I cannot, I cannot name name. I, you know, I, I, some, some, somebody asked me, which of those eight companies is your favorite? And 
I said, you have eight daughters. Which of your daughters is is your favorite, right? You're not going to answer that. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of happening. It's hard to predict which one is going because biotechs are so, there's so many uh, roadblocks, okay? So many things that you have to do that it's hard to say which is coming sooner and which is coming later, which is going to be uh, limited and which is going to be not, what's the expense. I, I think there's a lot of consideration and I just don't feel I'm in a position <laughs> to say what's my favorite. But I think on every hallmark of aging, there's a promising develop development of drug that will take time. Mm. Question Have I forgot. you ever re renovated your house? Yes, I have. So, so you already know that when he tells you June, it'll be ready. <laughs> you have to ask what year, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> well, you know. um, I didn't ask you, but should the, the TAME trial show benefit to metformin? And then I presume that will mean that physicians can prescribe it for aging. That's the hope, I guess. Um, and is that something that the FDA kind of have to approve? And because metformin is widely available and has been around for so long, if someone's thinking, you know, this is a this is big pharma trying to get their hands on something, it's a cheap drug, right? This is not an expensive drug. So, so first of all, any doctor can prescribe metformin to anyone. Okay, doctors have ability to prescribe drugs, whether they are for something or something else. Okay, it's just how conservative they want to be. It's not hard to, to convince doctors to prescribe it for me. Okay, I have a, I have, I have a way that's 100% uh, uh, sure. So, so let's start with that. P people can do it. When I said there are lots of things why we need metformin, and, and I think one of them is because it's generic and cheap, it will be available immediately, okay? It will have impact immediately. Doctors know about this drug. If there is another indication, it will be out there. And it will be for the poor, okay? There, there, is, a, there is a notion that this whole longevity field is for the rich people, okay? And, and, and as I said, I think poor people need help more than rich people. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, poor people also... They don't exercise, they don't have enough vegetables, they don't eat fish, they are obese, right? The poor you are, the more obese you are. Um, and you know what? We should, we, should, we should do everything about it, but you know, metformin is going to protect them from everything that they are not doing also. You know, so I think metformin is going to be a drug that will be effective more on the poor even than on the people who are exercising and dieting and, and doing everything anyhow. So I, I think that's another advantage. And if you're asking, will the FDA approve? Well, we'll, we'll come to the FDA and we'll say, FDA, you, we want to uh, approve metformin for prevention of a cluster of age-related diseases. And, and they'll probably do that. Our, uh, our discussion that didn't go well is, they don't want to call it aging. Okay, don't call it aging. You know, we'll call it aging. You call it whatever you want. Okay, we, we it's like porn. We know we know when we see it. But if you want to if you want to call it something else, call it whatever. But as long as we have this indication, we're okay. Yeah, this has been super interesting. Let's finish here with a message to the person listening that does have the goal of getting to eighty to eighty five in good health. Aside from keeping an eye on things like the TAME trial and rapamycin. What are your top tips for setting up a lifestyle that targets the hallmarks of aging and is likely to give people the best chance of achieving this goal? I, I mentioned exercise and diet and sleep and, and, um, and, and, and loneliness, right? Um, but, but, but I want to say something about the diet because this comes out of my study. You know, caloric restriction was a way to elongate life of animals, health span and lifespan of animal by 40%. Actually, no drug has been come close to what caloric restriction is doing in animals. And 
people have taken it to say, hey, you know, you have to eat less for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But that's not what we're doing in our studies. What we're doing is we're giving the food to the animals early in the morning. They're hungry, and they're finishing the whole the food in 20 minutes, and then they are fasting for 23 hours. And if we give them the food throughout the day, they are thinner, but they don't live much longer. So the fasting is maybe the most important part of the caloric restriction. And that's why we geroscientists, I don't know if Matt does it, <laughs> but a lot of us do it. We basically skip breakfast. You know, I had I finished my dinner today at 7. I'm going to eat probably tomorrow at 12 or, or 1 p.m. So that will be 17, 18 hours. I'm going to have coffee, black coffee in the morning without sugar. But, we, but you know, we have to change. Now we're eating for 16 hours and fasting for 8 when actually it's better for our body, it's better for our metabolism to stop getting the carbohydrate and using fat, which is a really clean energy. And a gram of fat has many, many more calories than a gram of carbohydrates. And so we're, we're, we're changing that. A lot of us are, are, are doing that and feeling good about it. And there's more data that's coming in human that some form of fasting sometimes is really good for your health. Yes, I've had Sachin Panda and Courtney Peterson on the show. And uh, Courtney, Courtney's work uh, over the last few years has been really interesting for people with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. They've looked at what's better from a glycemic control point of view, an early time restricted feeding. So starting that eating window earlier in the day, um, which is a bit harder from a social point of view because it often means you're not having dinner with your family, that makes it difficult. But they have found that glycemic control was better if someone was doing that eight hour or 10 hour window earlier in the day, as opposed to late and eating, you know, right up to, to dinner. So that's, that's another interesting kind of thing for people to think about. Um, I know that you're an advocate for the Mediterranean diet, so we won't step through that too much, but I wanted to quickly ask you about protein and aging. And you mentioned IGF-1 before. I've had Volta Longo on the show. I've had others who have different opinions um, talking about protein amount, talking about protein source, animal animal or plant. Is, is this um, or are these things that are important for us to consider if we want to improve our health span? You know, the, the only thing about uh, protein, you know, first, first of all, we don't know. But, you know, when you give protein, you increase uh, mTOR, which we want to decrease. Okay, so proteins have an anti-aging effect. On the other hand, we're losing lean body mass. We need something to try and, and, and prevent it. So there's a there's a competition here that we don't know really what to do with it. Um, I'll tell you for a nutritional perspective, and that has nothing to do with aging. That's just the, the American Dietetic Association is changing the recommendation all the time. And they know that lots of carbohydrates and lots of proteins are not good. And what did they do? They increased the fat. <laughs> and and, and I, I think that's a good that's a good thing to do because if you associate fat with cholesterol, yeah, but everybody takes statins and stuff. The, the fat, the effect of fat on cholesterol, we actually are pretty good at controlling. So that's what they decided to do. And it'll change because we will learn more. We will learn more about what you do when you're young or when you're old. It's not the same thing. And we'll see. Mm. Do you think the, the protein restriction sort of muscle mass longevity conversation is similar to metformin? in that it might negatively affect muscle mass if you're doing protein restriction or taking metformin, but it has a beneficial effect on longevity, for example. Yeah, I, I think I think you nailed it right, right on. But look, metformin has many effects, like exercise, okay? Like exercise, they have many effects. Um, when you exercise, you actually build your muscle. When you take metformin or you lower IGF, you actually decrease the muscle. Um, but still you have other effects, okay? You still, you know, you still want to protect your brain, <laughs> you protect your eyes, 
you, you protect other things. So it, it is a trade-off. Mm -hmm. It is a trade-off. And I, I really, I really um, don't, don't know that there's, it's not, it's not my, you know, it's a little bit my area of research, but I don't, I don't know how this is going to be resolved. Uh, high protein, low protein, low, low mTOR, high mTOR, how, how it's going to be resolved. But the muscle from an aging perspective is like the problem for us. <laughs> okay, we can affect a lot of things, but the muscle with, with low IGF, right? Everything is better, muscle is lower. Uh, it, it's a trade-off that we have and... Uh, and sort of as an extension of nutrition, are there any supplements that you think are worth consider considering for combating aging? There's been a lot of new startups selling supplements that they, they, they're claiming that they're targeting the hallmarks of aging, things like fisetin or terastilbene or L-theanine, etc. Is there, is there any evidence to support these sort of claims and is this something that you would recommend people consider? So in my book, Age Later, uh, I had this paragraph that's saying supplements are really good for the economy. Okay. Uh, lots of people are making uh, uh, money. And uh, I continued by saying uh, it's a problem. A lot of them don't contain what they have, uh, uh, you know, but, but I, I didn't see them. Some are dangerous, but I, di I didn't see them as dangerous overall. Uh, I've changed my mind a little bit. The, because I've started noticing that some of the supplements are very powerful. And I started noticing that people who take multi, uh, multi supplements, their biological age by the clocks can increase significantly. I, I, it doesn't mean that they are actually, you know, maybe it's the clock problem. But when you have potent supplements and you take 30 together or 105 together, you, we don't know how those supplements are working in coordination. Mm -hmm. It's like drugs sometimes. We can antagonize and we can poison also. So I'm very worried about supplements. Um, the one thing I want to say, uh, the most popular supplements are the NAD precursors. Okay, NMN and NR. And the challenge there is that they no doubt work in animals. But in humans, they don't work, they don't work well, okay? Or they might not work at all in what, in the sense of what we expect them to do. In other words, we haven't shown that the NAD levels are replenished in the muscle or there, there's any activation of mitochondria activity. There's always a link missing. So I would wait, I would wait on those, um, I think there is solution to that. You know, I think if you have normal NAD, it's not going to get higher anyhow. Um, a lot of the metabolites that we're, 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 we're measuring are metabolites that are byproducts that are being secreted. They're not going to play any role or they're not suggesting that there's any role in those supplements. So those supplements for me are, um, I, I don't want to say that they're no, not safe. There are some, there's some people who suggest that they're not safe. I don't, I don't worry about it. I just worry that they don't work in humans like they work in animals and we have to figure out why. Thank you so much, Nir. I would love to have you back on when the results from TAME are available. Uh, and in the meantime, I suggest people listen to your TEDx talk, get a copy of your book, Age Later. And if they would like to connect with you online and sort of stay up to date with everything that you're doing with Tame, is Twitter the best place for us to send them? Yes. My tweet is um, uh, near Barzilla MD. Uh, absolutely. And thank you for taking it. I think, I think people have to know where we are and, and our challenges. And thank you for helping. Thanks, Nia. I hope to uh, do it again sometime soon. And have a good tomorrow. <laughs> there we go, friends. Thank you for showing up and the effort you're making to take better control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again next week for another episode.